Amen. So good praising with you guys. And all the things that we deal with in life and all the things, good, bad, sad, it doesn't matter. He is the only thing that is worthy of our praise. The only thing. And we give it away to so many other counterfeit things, but he is the only thing that's worthy of our praise. Is that right? Thank you guys for worshiping with us. Before you take a seat and get ready to enjoy this wonderful service, such a good service today. Maybe turn and say hello to somebody that you haven't met yet. Good morning and welcome everyone. How's everyone doing today? How's everyone doing today? I know it's gray and rainy outside, but there's still joy in this building. There's hope in this building. There's new life. The Bible says that his mercies are available to us every morning in a new way. So that's what we believe in for today. My name is Dominic. It's so nice to meet you. I'm excited to be with you. If it's your first time with us, if you're brand new to Shoreline, if someone invited you, thanks for being courageous. Thanks for taking a risk. We hope you feel welcome here. We hope you feel invited and that you feel like this is a place that you could belong. We always say you don't have to believe what we believe to belong in this place. And so you are so welcome here and we're excited for you to be here. Uh, would you help me welcome our online community? Hi, AG. It's nice to see you guys online as well. I have friends watching from Germany, from California. They text me all the time with pictures of TVs watching from somewhere. So we value our online community a lot. I get to invite the ladies in this place. They chose me to invite the ladies to something. Um, but there's something really cool happening in a couple weeks from now. Uh, I know that for my wife, Anna, who was just singing right here, who is way cooler than I will ever be, um, that for her, uh, the, the community in her life, especially the females and the community of females in her life has been so impactful, especially in this last season. It's been really awesome to see. There's, there's uh, book clubs happening, there's pickleball happening, there's a uh, line dancing happening, and then every once in a while she sees me as well. But most of her time she's now spending uh, with some awesome females in her in her life. Obviously, I'm kidding, but she's um, in a great community, and I love that Shoreline has provided that for her. It makes our marriage better. It makes our relationship better uh, when she's in great relationships with other females. So I'm so grateful for this place. And so if that's something that would it be interesting to you, I want to invite you to a glamping trip that's happening May 2nd through May 4th. Guest speaker is going to be there. It's going to be amazing. Do you know that our uh, sisterhood people always have lots of surprise and delight for you? So there's only a few spots left, but if you're interested to join that, uh, you can tap on the little circle in your chair on your chairs or on the tables or online you can go to the events page at shoreline church and you can find all the information on there now if you can't make the whole glamping weekend trip you can come friday night friday night will be a bonfire at that same place where the glamping trip is and so that's in freeport at 6 p.m and i would want to just encourage you invite you don't wait to get into a great community. Start that this next couple of weeks and give it a try and be courageous with that as well. So we're going to enter a time of giving in our service in just a moment as the host team gets ready to do that. One thing that we have learned and that um, I've been thinking about this week is this. Generosity inspires generosity. So when we are generous, it'll inspire generosity in someone else, and that may inspire generosity in someone else. And so when it comes to giving of our time, our talent, our treasure, our finances, we believe as a church that generosity will inspire more generosity somewhere else. And I love that because it feels like an investment in something really great, something really good. And I know from Anna and me, that's a really powerful thing to let go even of our finances that we hold so tightly because we know God can do something way bigger way cooler than we could do uh, with that money anyway so I want to invite you to do that and we believe in that concept of 
generosity, inspiring generosity so much that we have a thing called irrational generosity, which is this. If you are an adult in here that's in significant need of food, shelter, or clothing, you have our permission as the buckets pass in a minute to reach in there and grab any loose cash that's in there because we believe that it's God's anyways and we believe that our generosity will inspire generosity in your life and then in someone else's. So I just wanna invite you to that and uh, in just a moment, actually host team, you can start passing the buckets right now. And we are in week three of a series called Deal Me In. And it's been a great, great series and we are excited for today because today it culminates in a baptism service. So we're very excited for that. Um, at the end of the service, that'll be happening. Um, but for the whole series, we've heard stories of people talking about their faith journey, talking about how Jesus has changed them radically. And so we're gonna hear a story in just a minute. And then after that story, I'd love for you to welcome up Pastor Graham for the final installment of Deal Me In. All right, hope you have a great Sunday. Hi, my name is Ramon. We've been here for approximately five years, and I'm plugged into Tribe, Men's Ministry, and also the host team. Hi, I'm Yvette, and I'm currently plugged into the host team and Tribe. So both of us grew up in uh, lower Alabama. Um, we got married very young, um, at 18. Uh, I joined the Marine Corps shortly thereafter. Um, I stayed angry with God for a long time after my mother and my father passed away. And my wife was in the church in Okinawa and, uh, I, and she finally was able to twist me by the arm to go to church for the first time in, in several years. Um, from going from there, we went to several different churches for several different locations. Um, we thought at, at the point before we came to Shoreline that we were really listening to what God wanted us to say. We thought that we really understood the direction he wanted us to go. Um, but there are some changes in my life to where he had to get my attention. I uh, went to the hospital um, and was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. That really that really shook me to the core, shook my wife and my children to the core. I didn't know how to take it. I didn't know what the next step was, but I did understand that we serve a God that has a plan for everything. It got to the point where when I was in the hospital a couple of times where I had to be, be completely dependent upon my wife and my kids and the, and the doctors and the nurses because I couldn't take care of myself. It made me understand what is really important in life and what real faith is and what I should be listening to rather than what the world tells me to listen to. We had to stand both in faith to be able to balance each other out by putting God in the midst of everything. That means for a church, that means for the things that happen in your everyday life, that means, uh, you know, prioritizing what God wants you to do and what he's asking you to do uh, above each other above anything else and understanding that once you do that all the other things will fall into place. God is real and what he did on the cross was not in vain. We actually Enjoy. We understand that that work that we're doing towards the, the the ministry and the kingdom is is a good thing and it's a joyful thing for each of us. And we've gotten more joy out of our lives because we have invested ourselves in in true faith. So that's where we are now, and the reason why we've become so dogmatic in our pursuit of of what God wants us to do rather than what anybody else wants us to do. Pretty cool, huh? 
past three weeks, we've just had stories about people who come to like a crossroads in their life. And they just go, all right, we're going to choose fear or we're going to choose faith here, which every one of us has had that choice. And the way that people choose faith and God shows up in the middle of that just kind of never ceases to amaze. It is what our church is built up on, the hope of God meeting us when we take that crossroads of faith. Good morning. My name is Graham. I just went for it. By the way, that video, it's, I'm just telling you right now, it's not going to get any better than that video. I've already done this message. Not that great. If you want to leave now, that video is all you needed to see this morning. Uh, help me welcome those watching online. What's up, guys? Glad y'all are with us. Love you guys. Uh, we are here for you. Uh, one of the pastors here, we are actually in the very last week of this series called Deal Me In. And this whole series has been talking about how do we develop an authentic faith? So if you weren't here the past two weeks, I would encourage you guys to go back, listen to the last two messages, because there's this progression that we've been going through. Uh, the first week, the message was titled, Chip in a Chair. And the whole idea was, how do we put ourselves in a position for God to prove himself dependable? What does that look like? Then last week, the message was titled, Annie Up. And just saying, as we are taking our steps towards developing that faith, what role do we play in taking the next steps? Again, an interesting concept. So if that intrigues you, go back and watch that message. Uh, this morning, the message is titled, All In. All In. Uh, what we are talking about today is the concept of committing everything. Pushing all the chips forward. Saying, I I'm not going to leave anything behind. There's, there's nothing reserved. There's no straddling the fence. There's no halfway in. I am willing to risk everything inside of that. What does God want us to do when it comes to being all in? How does he ask that to manifest in our lives? The concept of all in is terrifying, uh, I think, for all of us. Because if you've been hurt in here, which is everybody, um, then there's a part of you that goes, I don't want to put that part out there again. Uh, once, once you feel like you've been dismissed, once you feel like you've been vulnerable and then that part of you has been mistreated, then it just has a self-protective instinct. You go, well, never again. And the idea of being completely vulnerable and completely raw, all of a sudden you, you don't have control of how much of you gets hurt if it's all out there. If you're at least reserving a little bit, the 20%, the, the most intimate 20% of you, then you can say, okay, you can hurt the 80%, but at least this is going to be personal to me. But there's a concept of going all in that is, that is terrifying. There's a story in, in the Bible of this woman who finds herself in a position uh, almost like we're talking about today. She has been hurt so many times. Uh, she has been given up on that pretty much she has relegated her life down to this life of survival. There's no purpose for me. I don't have value. Uh, no, nobody wants me around. I'm not contributing to society. And so as Jesus said, I'm, my, my whole life, I'm really just going to try to hide and not get hurt again. The woman wakes up in the morning and says that it's the cool of the morning, right? So she can feel the cool air through the walls. And this is the time when everybody in the town, they run their errands. You do that in the cool of the day. So you go get your water. You do your different things. Well, this woman just sits there and waits. And the minutes turn into hours, and still she waits. And all of a sudden, the cool of the morning kind of melts away, and you can feel the heat start to come in more and more until it says the hottest part of the day and the heat is just baking the roof. You can feel it come through the cracks of the house. And it's at this point when the woman walks over routinely, grabs the large kind of earthen jar, puts it up on her shoulder, goes to the door, pushes it open, right? Blast of hot air and dust hits her in the face and alone dejected, broken, ashamed. This woman makes her way to the well by herself in the hottest part of the day. See, this woman in the town, she's got a reputation. And her reputation is that she is known as the, the promiscuous one, the one who sleeps around. Uh, she has been married five times, and the man that she's sleeping with now is not her husband. 
And quite honestly, this woman's just thinking, I just can't take those looks anymore. I can't take the people in the town looking at me in disgust. I can't feel that shame anymore. And so really, her whole life is isolated. And she's just thinking, I'm going to survive hiding these parts of me until I can eventually die. But she's given up on having value or purpose. Well, she gets there to the well, and there's a man there at the well. And this man, spoiler alert, is Jesus. And the man has starts up a conversation with her, which is weird for a couple of reasons. One is culturally in that time, men would not just start conversations with women. That's just not how it went. In fact, you wouldn't have a conversation with a woman unless her husband was present. So weird point number one. Number two was that she could tell by his accent that this was a Jewish man and she was a Samaritan woman. And that doesn't, that's doesn't mix. That's oil and water. It, it was contentious to say the least. Kind of like, like Jews and Palestinians now, nowadays. Like if there's, there's animosity there, right? But still, this man has a conversation with her. And this man, Jesus, asks her for a drink, and she obliges. And then a little bit into the conversation, Jesus says to her, uh, I offer you a different type of water. I offer you living water. And when he says this, it's actually a reference back to something said in the Old Testament where God was known as the fountain of living water. And so what Jesus is saying in that moment essentially is, I know what you're looking for. I know why you're here by yourself. I know why you have scheduled your entire life around isolation. I know why that you are here in the throes of shame. I get all that. And I'm offering you that I am the savior you're looking for. I am the Messiah. I am he. Then she didn't get the reference. And uh, actually, Jesus takes a pretty sharp left turn and goes very personal with her. And he calls out the failed marriages. He calls out her current relational position. He calls out the disappointments. He calls out every single thing that she was hoping to avoid by going in the middle of the day, and Jesus is bringing it all up. You know, I've read that story before and been like, why would you do that, Jesus? Just get a drink of water and move on. She's already feeling horrible, right? But the reason is because he's offering her living water. He's offering her forgiveness. He's offering her grace. He's offering her a new beginning, and he knows if I don't bring up these horrible parts of her, she's going to think this guy's only offering me living water because he doesn't know who I am. And Jesus goes, I know exactly who you are. I know everything that you've done, and it doesn't change what I'm offering. It doesn't change this crossroads of faith that I'm inviting you on. Here's a living water. Well, because she just felt that shame, remember, this is everything she wanted to avoid, uh, she diverts the conversation really quickly. And actually, she has kind of like a theological debate with Jesus about worship, which is really funny. Uh, and Jesus, you know, they go back and forth a little bit. And, you know, this woman's just kind of stammering. She's just throwing things out there, trying to avoid what Jesus wants to talk about. And finally, she says this. Verse 25, the woman said, well, listen, I know that Messiah, I know that Christ is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Well, just then his disciples return. They were sent off to get something to eat. And they're surprised to find him, it says, talking with a woman, which is just typical disciples, just missing the moment completely, right? All they see are social norms. All they see is etiquette. All they see is, uh, this isn't really supposed to go. They don't see this, this miracle of transformation that is happening. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Because they're cowards. It says in this moment that she has something that speaks to her. There's, there's a spiritual moment that she has. It goes beyond wisdom. It goes beyond intellect. It goes beyond logic. That Jesus speaks words to her that hit her in a different way than anybody else has ever um, spoken to her. It hits in her spirit. And listen, I want to speak. Maybe this is you in here, that you've heard TED Talks, and they're awesome. 
and you've seen documentaries and they're great, and you've heard smart people talk and that's fantastic, but maybe you've been in here and you've felt that God has spoken to you that is something more than topical wisdom, something that is more than temporary logic, and you go, ah, that hits me in a way that nobody else has ever spoken to me, that hits me in my spirit. This is the moment that she's having. That Jesus is speaking words, but it's not even the words that he's speaking. He's speaking to her soul, to her spirit. Something comes alive. And the dead parts of her that she's given up on, the parts that she goes, I'll never have value. This will never be redeemed. This will never be good. In fact, the rest of my life is given up on is shame because of that. He begins to speak new life and forgiveness and love into the dead parts of her. And she begins to have hope and life course through her body and something shifts in her spirit. Then leaving her water jar, the whole reason that she even came there, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and they made their way towards him. Listen, not 30 minutes ago, not 30 minutes ago, this woman was doing everything possible to avoid any contact with anybody from town. In a moment, she has life breathed into her soul in a way that she's never experienced before. And what she was avoiding at all costs before, she is now running towards. She runs into the town. And I love this. What's her invitation? It's, it's not this big theological presentation. She, she doesn't know. She is 30 minutes into this. She had a combo with a guy at the well. And so she's not like, here's my, you know, my PowerPoint presentation. She just walks in. What's her invitation? Come and see. Come and see. I mean, maybe this is our experience in here, right? But first, I want to let you know that it doesn't matter if this is your first Sunday ever. You can be somebody who invites and if the person looks at you and goes, well, you know, how do you guys feel about post-tribunal rapture? You can be like, I can't even spell any of that. All I know is that there's something that I've experienced that goes beyond topical wisdom. There's something that has inspired and brought life to the hurting dead parts of myself. The part that I thought I would be discounted because of is actually something that God is breathing life. Would you just come and see? Would you just come and see? And man, for some of you guys in here, this is your story. You are the one who was invited. You are the one who was invited. And, and somebody just said, listen, would you come and see? You go, what's it about? They go, I don't even know. There's a slide in there. There's, there's a lot going on. Would you just come and see? And then you were willing just to come and take a seat. Um, and so what happens is when this lady goes all in, when she is willing to bear those vulnerable parts of herself, God is able to meet her there. And that's, here's what we think a lot of times. We think that we need to hide ourselves out of protection, put on this protective layer, this shield around us so that we can't get hurt. Hide the hurting, raw, vulnerable parts of yourself so that you don't get hurt when actually the truth is the things that we do to keep us from getting hurt actually keep us from being healed. God needs us to be all in. Think about that, that, that catch-22, essentially, right? We, we just think to ourselves, gosh, if I put it out there, I'm going to be hurt. I, I think about this in, in any relationship. Think about this in marriage, right? We think, I, I've talked with people in their second or their third marriage before, and they go, um, we're, we're doing separate bank accounts, like, we're, I, I'm hedging my bet to the nth degree because when this inevitably fails, like everything else has, I don't want to be hurt. I don't want to be put out like I am. The catch-22 is that your marriage will never thrive if you're not wholly in. It's, it's for relational health. Intimacy has to be developed with that. It's the same thing with our relationship with God, right? If, if we just think, oh, God, I trust that you're good enough for the top 80%, but not for the bottom 20. He goes, the breakthrough in forgiveness and freedom is for the bottom 20. I know that you've been hurt by other people. Man, do not project that on me. I'm the one that wants to show that love is greater than your greatest faults. I mean, for me, this is, this is a big part of my story. I mean, this is not easy for me in marriage, to be honest. And, you know, at every single turn, when I'm trying to just, you know, I felt abandoned in my life and I felt given up on in my life. And it's just so 
crazy how your body just goes, don't do it again. Don't do it again. You're going to get hurt. And at every turn, Kristen in marriage is like, I want to love you through this. And it's just so hard to open up those parts of ourselves because we don't want to be hurt, but actually we are just keeping ourselves from experiencing a life of freedom and love. We are keeping ourselves from being healed and we are trying to protect those parts of ourselves. So it's a moment, it's a shift for this woman. It's a shift, an opportunity for us in here, what it looks like to instead to go for, uh, is this a good thing or not for him to go? The only way that this works is for you to completely surrender. Everybody has to have an all-in moment. You have to have an all-in moment where you go, no chips left behind, nothing in the reserve. God, I'm trusting you with everything. Matthew 16, 25, for whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever tries to control it, whoever hedges the bets, that's not how this thing works. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If you completely trust in a good God, I will give you life and life abundantly. There are three areas of our everyday life that I believe that God is asking us to be all in for. And again, this morning, everything is shaped around all in. And I desire, and our desire is that we would kind of stack hands on a few areas that we are hedging our bets in, that we are straddling the fence. And we go, what? You know what? This morning is going to mark the time when I said no longer. I'm going to step all in. Three areas. First one, is that we would be all in with our perspective. After the lady goes and talks to the people in the town, uh, the disciples, <laughs> just a bunch of idiots, listen to this. So the disciples come up to him and they go, um, Rabbi, you need to eat something in the middle of like this crazy transformational miracle that he's doing, right? They're just like, you got to eat, right? Are you, are you hungry? You got to eat something. And just missing the moment completely. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then the disciples said to each other, oh, I guess someone brought him some food. Just, you got tater tots in your toga? This is how, like, you got toga tots, Jesus? Because we're hungry too. Share the tots, right? It's like, no, <laughs> you guys are missing the point here. My food, said Jesus, toga tots is going to take off, by the way. I think we should mass produce that. <laughs> My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Listen, don't you have a saying it's still four months until harvest? Here's what I tell you. Open your eyes. Another translation says, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe now for harvest. Open your eyes. Lift up your eyes. Jesus is saying, I need you to see differently than the world sees. I, I want you to receive my vision in this. Don't, don't, don't be limited by social norms. Don't be, don't be so focused on social etiquette. This is not about toga tots, right? There is something bigger that is happening here. I am doing a miracle in this woman who has given up on herself, and I am breathing new life and vision and purpose to her. See beyond these, these physical limitations. Would you see something that I'm doing in the internal scope? And so many times do we fall into this as we, we fail to just stop and be all in with our perspective. Now, are we going to have everything figured out? No way. Never that we're humans, we're, we're goofballs. Uh, but there is a component of just of pausing, saying, before I post that thing on social media, pause. Man, is there something going on that God is calling you to that is beyond just what you see in that moment? Pause before that moment of judgment and just say, is God actually asking me to love somebody who doesn't deserve it because I don't deserve it? Pause. Open your eyes. Lift your eyes up. My, the beach, by the way, is my happy place. Uh, love the beach. Love being there. Went there yesterday. Got scorched, even though I know I got a shiny nose and it's the worst. But uh, not too long ago, I took the twins to the beach. And I want them to like it the way that I like it, you know, because it's the most beautiful beach on earth. And so we go there and uh, we brought like buckets and shovels because we're going to make sand castles. And we're sitting there on, in Destin Beach, the most gorgeous beach in the entire world. And uh, Jace is like, oh, I wanted the red shovel. And, and, she, and Tatum's like, I got the red shovel. 
They're like, no, red shovel. And, and they're for 20 minutes bickering about this shovel, and I'm slowly losing my mind. And really, I feel like eventually I would just go, look up, please. Open your, <laughs> open your eyes. There's way more beauty going on here than you are understanding. There's something that is just gorgeous that will stop and open our eyes and shift our perspective. Do you know that God is using you in the eternal orchestration of somebody else right now? He has plans for you, not the person next to you, for you. In, in your workplace, in your family, in, in your golf group, in, in, your, in the store that you always go into that you're regular. He is using you in a way, if we will pause for a second and just realize there's something going on. Open your eyes. Look up. And then our perspective, it very slowly bleeds into this next thing that God wants us to be all in with. He wants us to be all in with our perspective, and he wants us to be all in with our expectations. Be all in with your expectations. With your expectations, see differently than the world does. You know, he does this in a story. So the forefather, uh, Abraham, if you've ever heard uh, Father Abraham had many sons and many sons. Okay, that Abraham. Before he was Abraham, his name was Abram. And God had promised Abram something good. He said, I, I will do something great with you in the world. Well, Abram gets later in years, he gets to be 75. I'm not going to say old because we have 75-year-olds here. And I would never call you old to your face, ever. <laughs> I do it a few feet away because I know your hearing's not great, but I would never, <laughs> ever say it. Anyway, so God has this conversation with Abram at 75, and here's how the combo goes. Genesis 15:1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring. Sounds like a weird way to start a complaint, doesn't it, with behold? But whatever. And a member of my household, I guess God is going to have to be my heir. And he, God, brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars, if you're even able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram is 75. And by the way, God's promise of having a son doesn't even come to fruition till Abram is a hundred and his wife is 90. Talk about waiting till the 11th hour to, uh, that's, that's just, that's gnarly. That's not our reality, right? Raise your hand if you're 90 plus in here on birth control. Just, no. In my mind, I was like, there's gonna be one person that raises their hand and just ruins the minds of the people sitting next to them. Here's the point of what he's saying, okay. When I take you outside and I say, look up, open your eyes, you know, I, I'm, what I'm not saying is I want you to count actually how many stars you see, and that will be the exact number of descendants that you're having. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you are ever in doubt of who is declaring you good, if you are ever in doubt of who is giving you a promise, if you are ever in doubt of who is greater than your problems, who is greater than your diagnosis, who is the one that is claiming protection over your life, then I want you to look up, I want you to open your eyes, and I want you to see the vastness of the universe. The God who breathes stars into existence is the same one who speaks words of value and forgiveness and love over you. It is that God who is declaring it. If you ever think, nope, not, God can't be bigger than my addiction. God can't be bigger than, than, than what I've got going on. I am too far gone. Then he goes, go outside, open your eyes. Look up. Just to give you a little perspective here, in case you just needed a, a, a punch over the goal line today to be like, oh, is this God really worth my respect, really worth my praise? Uh, here's how big of a God we're talking about, okay? Whenever you stop, you open your eyes and you look up. All right, so I want you to envision the greater Destin area and then into the state of Florida, which is a big state, I'm from Texas, which is another big state. I've driven across Texas, and it takes like nine days, right? Okay, it's going to expand more to the whole United States. If you've done a lot of traveling, the U.S. is big. Well, if you're a world traveler, you know that the U.S. is just this tiny little micro 
place and it's just a big old world. Well, this is the world. This golf ball is representing represent the world. In fact, the, imagine that this earth is the size of this golf ball. I'm about to give you some perspective here. Okay? Not even close to the biggest star that we've discovered, but a very big star. Uh, it's called Beetlejuice. That's the name of the star. Pretty sweet. Um, I want to give you a perspective when we say star-breathing God, what we're talking about. It says that if our earth was the size of a golf ball, and you went and put this at the base of the Empire State Building, that the size of Beetlejuice, the star, would be six Empire State Buildings on top of each other. Star-breathing God. In fact, 262 trillion Earths would fit inside of this star, which is enough Earths, enough golf balls to fill the entire Superdome 3,000 times. Open your eyes. Look up. I know that that problem seems insurmountable. I know that what's going on in relation, it just feels like there could never be life inside of this. He goes, would you be willing to trust me with this? Shift your perspective. Shift your expectations. Isaiah 55, 8, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. And when we do an all-in moment, there's a moment of surrender, and here's the scary part. For me, I like to have things thought out. And I have kids now that I'm trying to introduce to the things that I like. I want them to like the beach. I want them to like God. I love God. I want them to love God. And there's a lot of stuff that I just can't explain to my kids. But I feel like I have to buffer them from it. I almost, sometimes I feel like I have to be God's PR person. You ever feel that, you know? Or like to one of your friends when they're like, how come this didn't work? And you're like, listen, I promise he's good, okay? He's super busy right now. There's a lot going on in the world. I know he'll get to you. Like, you just feel like you have to justify what's going on. And God goes, that, you're still trying to control. Even as a parent, you're trying to control. I try to keep my kids from experiencing disappointment because I think that they're going to attribute that to God's goodness. And God goes, that's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you to be the answer to everything. I'm not asking you to fix everything. I'm certainly not asking you to keep your kids from disappointment. They're going to experience disappointment the rest of their lives. Here is what I am asking. Here's what my prayer is for your kids. Here's what our prayer is in this room, is that in those moments we're experiencing struggles and disappointment, when we're beyond answers and beyond logic and wisdom, that we would open our eyes, that we would look up, we would see the vastness of the universe and realize that we have a star-breathing God who goes, trust me to protect you. Trust me with the hurting parts of you. Trust that that God is bigger than your diagnosis. That God is bigger than the struggle that you're in right now, that he will see you through to the end. Um, last one is that we would be all in with our priorities. All in with our priorities. John 4, 42. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. So this can be your invitation. This can be your invitation. We say we want to be an inviting church, that all you have to say is come and see. Come and see. And for those of you guys who are in here, and you did, you attended with your friend, you can tell your friend, you know what? To be honest, I first was just showing up because you wouldn't leave me alone. Uh, but now I realize that God has spoken something to my spirit that I can't deny. There's something happening on the inside that goes beyond human logic and, and wisdom that God has spoken to my spirit. I now believe that what Jesus has done, dying on the cross, raising from the dead, isn't just for blanket humanity, but I accept that that is true for myself. It's an all-in moment. This morning, this morning, what does it look like for you to have an all-in moment? The things that you have been hedging bets on, the things that you have been reserved on, what does it look like you, for you to lean in? Matthew 22, 37 through 39, people come up to Jesus and they go, hey, what's the most important commandment? Cliff notes this whole thing for me. I don't have time to listen to everything. Just hit me with it. What's the most important thing? Here's what Jesus says. 
love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, because this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I love that he, he goes, man, you want to know how to go all in? You, know, you want to know how to experience the freedom that you haven't before? He doesn't go, fear me. He doesn't say, obey me. He just says, love me. Would you lay it all out? Would you allow me to love you? That bottom 20% that you have never trusted anybody with, that hurts so badly to bring up, would you allow me to love that part of you? You know, this morning we we're having Baptism Sunday. And in a second, we are going to really open this up. And, and I always say, man, if it's zero people, if it's 100 people, we just want to give people the opportunity to have an all-in moment. And here's what I believe. Uh, I believe that God is stirring in your spirit right now. I believe that God is speaking to you in a way that maybe just earthly wisdom never has before. And there's something that goes, I feel like I've just had a reserved relationship with God. I've been holding things back. And I'm wondering why I'm not experiencing that freedom. Why am I not experiencing that healing? Why am I not experiencing the power? And it's because we're just kind of back and forth. We're straddling the fence. We're hedging our bets. And God goes, I'm just asking for an all-in moment that you would be willing to completely surrender and give to me. Here's what baptism represents. Baptism is to say, really just a symbol. We, in fact, we say that it's an outward expression of an inward decision. That we go, you know what? I trust that Jesus didn't just die for, that for humanity, that he died for me. It was my face that he considered joy to go to the cross for. And I want my life to be defined by what he has done, not by what I do, good or bad. And when I go down symbolically, when I'm under the water, this is just as Jesus died. And when I come back up, when Jesus rose from the dead, he conquered sin and death. He made it so that we are in right standing with God the Father, the relationship we are designed for. And as we come up out of the water symbolically, we say that old us is staying down. The old us that tried to control, that tried to save ourselves, that, that, that just needed everything to be okay and perfect, all of that is down. Instead, I'm raising with new grace and forgiveness. So we celebrate the moments of surrender, the all-in moments. So I'd ask everybody to stand up for me. And here's what we're going to do. Um, if you have registered for baptism, if you would just go ahead and meet right over here in this corner, uh, we, we have shirts for you that, that you can put on over your shirt right now that you can be baptized in. But I'm going to go even further. I think that there's some people in here that have never had the opportunity to publicly declare, I'm all in. I think there's some people in here that you just feel God impressing on your spirit right now that just goes, you're going to look back on this day, and this is going to be the day that you said, I was all in. I left nothing behind, nothing in the reserve. And if that's you, we have shirts for you to be baptized in. I know you weren't planning on getting in the pool today, but God is, is impressing this on you. Don't miss this opportunity. If that's you, go ahead and come on over here. We got shirts for you as well. For everybody else, uh, we have poker chips today at... Did I bring one up? Nailed it. We have poker chips for you today uh, that says all in. And I want this to be almost like a milestone, a, a memorial of today where you just go, you know what? Every once in a while, you need to pause with your perspective and go, Jesus, I'm all in. I trust you. With your expectation, you go, open your eyes, lift up your eyes. And the times where what you're going through seems too big for God, that you walk outside and you look up to the stars, the vastness of the universe, and know that God has the hairs on your head numbered, and he loves everything about you. Let's pray. Father, we just want to celebrate the way that you work and so this morning, we're just, the best way that we know how, we are open-handed. We are going all in. We're pushing all of our chips in the end, uh, all of our chips in, and we're just saying, would you meet us there? In a, in a place of vulnerability, would you meet us there? It's terrifying. 
but you want to claim value and life and vibrancy over the dead, hurting parts of us. And so we surrender all in this moment. In your precious name, amen. For everybody else, we're going to worship a little bit. And again, if God's pressing on you, come on over here and let's, let's get down.
celebrate in this place so beautiful to be together I think we might have some more people getting baptized so we're gonna continue to sing a little bit but if you have kids in the kids room you need to pick them up go ahead uh, we're gonna sing a little bit more so feel free to stay around uh, to worship with us if you have kids to pick them up can you can bring them in there's another service coming in just a few minutes uh, we're gonna be baptizing after the 1130 service so if you're leaving that's uh, wonderful God bless you have a great Sunday we're gonna stay together a bit more and sing some songs so uh, happy to see you. Happy Sunday to you guys. We're going to continue with some worship too. 